just looking at this chart, Paul doesn't seem to give us any any copious amount of details that deal with the com- second coming that is connected with the Battle of Armageddon. There are some details. Second Thessalonians does bring in the um, lawless one being destroyed by Yeshua's brightness and um, you know being rendered uh, useless before he's finally destroyed. So we do have those brief details, but the bulk of the information that Paul shared with his audience in Thessalonians is related to rapture and resurrection. Both of those topics ha- uh, occupied the bulk, bulk of his details, of his attention. And likewise, um, as one author put it, when we get to Jesus, all of the discourse teachings, he doesn't even really mention the Battle of Armageddon at least not in the way that we would recognize it as being the Battle of Armageddon, meaning the gathering together, which is preceded by all of the signs that are outlined in the all of the discourse, I believe indicate a, resur- a, a resurrection slash rapture sequence, not a Battle of Armageddon sequence. And again, it's because of the way that there's a parallel between what Jesus said and what Matt, what what Paul said. And we know almost, it's, it's kind of like we reverse engineer. When we get to the Thessalonian letters and corroborate those with the Corinthian passage that Paul gave also, we know that he's talking about, um, we know that he's talking about resurrection slash rapture. And then we reverse engineer and go back to Jesus' words and go, ah, here's the parallel. That means Jesus must also have been talking about rapture and resurrection meaning paul didn't get it first jesus gave it first and then paul picked up on it and wrote it down and then i think the gospels that were actually written later but here's the point i'm also trying to bring up is the 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 fact that there are two separate events doesn't is not a slam dunk argument that those two events are separated by any length of time such as seven years or even three and a half years or even um five months like i mentioned when you read through matthew and then you read through thessalonians like we're showing you on this list you don't get the sense that there is a separation between the two events you see them almost as one event other than the fact that we have most of the details that look like a rapture but other than that I don't think the disciples perceived that there was one event known as rapture and a second event known as second coming. I think they just saw them as one single event, one um, cumulative event where the rapture takes place, we go up, and then we immediately maybe come back down to earth and and the kingdom is established, something like that. I mean, I don't, I don't get the sense that they probably would have picked up on that. They probably wouldn't have said that there were two different events. So there's a case that can be made from a post-trib perspective that maybe Jesus is just describing one event. The, the really the face value reading seems to just be one event, and I'm on board with this. This being described as one event. I'm sorry, not one event. One parousia. But when I begin to put the rest of the Bible in place namely the book of Revelation, then I can realize that there's some separation between the two events. Again, it's this slide again that I am that I keep working from. But it's still one event, because when you zoom out, the rapture and the second coming just kind of sit on top of one another. They, they really look like one single event, which is probably why a lot of famous Bible teachers hold to that position. I've already mentioned many of them in the past, right? Dr. Dr. Um, Michael Brown, uh, Professor Craig Keener, um, Joel Richardson, um, Douglas Moo, um, Pastor John Piper. These are all prominent post-tribbers, uh, not to mention some of the others like uh, Gundry and um, Robert Gundry. And uh, oh, who's at the other? Uh, the, um, drawing a blank on his name, but um, uh, prominent post-tribbers. Uh, who say that there's really just one event at the end of the seven years, and it's this one event known as the Day of the Lord, the the coming of the Lord, and it includes the rapture and the second coming. And I say, uh, yeah, you're zooming out, and you're looking at the zoom out. All right, let's look at Brother Eggman's notes here. We're at about 30 minutes into the study, if I'm correct. Let me take a look. Yeah, we've got about 30 minutes left. I think we might be able to finish this tonight. We'll see. I'm not rushing, though. These are Brother Eggman's words. As we've seen, both Paul and Jesus use the imagery of Jesus coming on the clouds and gathering the saints off the earth to meet him in the sky. When the Bible mentions Jesus coming on the clouds, it is also talking about the rapture. Remember, 
this coming on the clouds language goes all the way back to Daniel chapter 7. This event is informally called many different names, the gathering of the saints, the snatching away of the saints, the catching up of the saints, and most commonly, the rapture. These are all talking about the same event. Revelation 14, 14 through 16 illustrates Jesus' second coming in connection with the rapture. So now we have a quote from Revelation. And keep in mind that most of the book of Revelation is best understood when it's read in its normal, normal, customary, sequential manner, meaning that the events are played out um, consecutively one after another as you're reading the chapters and the words. However, we also have to allow for two other features that are very important in the book of Revelation, and I'm mentioning that because of its relevance to the Revelation 14 that we're about to read. In the book of Revelation, we also have this the reality that John is in heaven, and he's seeing events on earth, but then he also sees events in heaven, right? In chapter 4 of Revelation, he's caught up to heaven, and then he's told to record what he sees. So, he sees events in heaven, from heaven, and he records those events. But while he's in heaven, he also uh, sees events on earth, and he records those events. And, so, and maybe he just goes plops back down to earth when he records events. I'm not sure. But either way, the point is there's, there's heavenly events and earthly events. Now, why is this relevant? Because in John's writing of the events, he doesn't write them in an overlapping fashion. He writes like start to finish one through seven in heaven. Then he looks down at earth and he writes events on earth. But we have to realize that while the events in heaven were taking place, the events on earth were also taking place at the same time, and thus, when he drops down, down from one place to the other, the book of Revelation does something known as uh, recapitulation. It, back, it goes backwards a little bit in time to the beginning of when maybe one event started in heaven, and when it drops down, back down to earth, it goes backwards to the beginning of when the timer started so that we can understand that it was happening consecutively what, with what was going on in heaven. Understand what I mean there without getting lost? So, in so doing, when we get to Revelation 14, we have John describing an overview in recapitulation fashion of this concept of rapture and reaping, and he does so in order to, without getting ahead of myself, we're not in the book of Revelation yet, but he does so in order to give us an overview of what's going to be important for, from God's perspective as pouring out the final wrath of God on earth. He just got through pouring out the trumpet judgments, and then he, uh, Revelation describes this beast who comes up out of the sea, and then he describes a second beast, right? So, he's describing Antichrist and the false prophet. Then he starts describing um, details related to the Antichrist's program of, of um, setting up the mark of the beast. And so, um, because we rewound to the midpoint of the week, in Revelation 13, with the beast coming up out of the sea, as it were, meaning the emergence of Antichrist onto the scene correlates with the midpoint of the week. But we've already got through reading about the rapture in Revelation chapter 7 earlier, right, with this group of people that show up on the heavenly landscape who have just come out of Great Tribulation. According to Revelation chapter 7, this would correlate with the uh, people who just got raptured. And then the trumpet judgments begin in Revelation chapter 8. But if you'll notice, we're in Revelation 14 now. Well, what happened to 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13? So, we had to kind of rewind a little bit. And it, in other words, recapitulate. And so, rewinding, we're just looking at the rapture and the bigger picture again. So, that's kind of the setup to Revelation 14, 14 through 20, what we're looking at. John says, I looked and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And so, even though the language doesn't talk about resurrection, it doesn't talk about rapture, it doesn't talk about the sixth seal. There are a lot of details that are left out, but there's enough detail that connects it back to the book of Daniel chapter 7 with the cloud writer, right? One writing on a cloud, one like the Son of Man. Those descriptions let us know that this is almost 100% that this is Jesus. It could be another angel, that it, uh, because in verse 15 it says, then another angel um, talks about, uh, take your sickles, like there's two, 
to angels doing these sickle reaping. But we could see this as Jesus because it talks about this one seated on a cloud and he's like a son of man. And I don't think that the phrase son of man is applicable to an angel, a mere angel. But he's got a crown of gold in his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud. Take your sickle and reap because the time to reap has come for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud, right? And mentions him twice sitting on a cloud. He swung a sickle over the earth and the earth was harvested. So this is a type of rapture passage. I know some people would say that this is not a rapture. This is simply maybe um, a reaping that's connected with the end of the age, but not doesn't have to be the, har- the, the rapture itself. Um, for the moment, I'm going to go with this being a type of rapture recapitulation um, view. No, not a lot of detail, but similar to the book of Daniel, very zoomed out version. Remember in the book of Daniel, there's also no details given about six seal and blood moon uh, stars falling from the sky and no um, details that from the earth dwellers perspective, what this would look like in the book of Daniel chapter seven, there's, there aren't a lot of details right in that chapter about resurrection and rapture it simply describes this one who's on the clouds approaching the ancient of days to receive his kingdom and so there's a very broad picture being painted but yet we know it's still the end of days so that's kind of what's going on i believe in revelation here so let's keep going with brother eggman here's his description of what we just read jesus comes seating on a cloud and harvests the earth this harvest is not specifically defined as the rapture but we can infer that it is discussing the rapture based on other scriptures such as the matthew 24 and first thessalonians 4 and 5 which mention jesus coming on the clouds in association with the rapture and so this is a, a it is an assumption it's an inference but I think it's a safe one at this point in time, given the fact that we have the details that show up elsewhere. I, um, a, a friend of mine in the chat room right now, and he and I were having a discussion on when we're looking at any given passage and we have details in the passage, how far out from the context do you zoom out to get your, in, your interpretation? Well, you want to start small. He and I both kind of agreed on that. Start with the immediate context and see if you can have something that makes sense. And then you start zooming out and looking at details that are found in other places of the Bible. This is one of those cases where I think his explanation is probably a little bit more, a little stronger than mine. The immediate context doesn't seem to be a rapture passage. So, but when we zoom out and we look at the cloud writing details and the, um, uh, the 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 cloud writer and the um, what was the other detail? The cloud writer and the son of man. When we look at those, that language, this definitely takes us all the way back to Daniel, takes us back to Matthew 26 when Yeshua said to, before Caiaphas, he said to the high priest, you will see um, the, the, the um, son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of glory. So he used both son of man and cloud writing glory, cloud writing language in one um uh, statement. Of course, we know he's combining imagery from Psalm chapter uh, 110, where he's, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit unto my right hand, sit at my right hand. He used that language, and he combined it, conflated it with the, the Daniel chapter 7 language about, uh, I saw one in the night visions, Daniel says, I saw one like the Son of Man uh, approaching with the clouds of heaven, approaching the Ancient of Days. So, Brother Eggman is just reminding us that even though we don't see immediate rapture language in Revelation chapter 14. When I say immediate rapture, I'm talking about um, uh, snatching away, gathering together, people moving from point A to point B. Um, we don't see any angels mentioned that are reaping or anything like that. I'm sorry, uh, gathering the elect. We don't have the language that talks about um, resurrection or anything like that. But we have this broad language of reaping the earth. And that seems to be consistent with a rapture model where there are the group of elect on the earth that Jesus comes down personally and using his angels as his assistants, he gathers these people from the earth. And that's consistent with the um, uh, the sickle uh, picture that's painted. So, 
Let's keep going. Revelation 14, 17-20, which directly follows this passage that we just read on the harvest of the earth, mentions the wrath of God being poured out on the earth as well. So now we have another quote. And this is important because of the timing of the previous verses that we just read in Revelation 14 that describe a type of rapture, the swinging the sickle and reaping the earth, prior to the sequence of what we're going to read about now is obviously another um, sickle event with this uh, reaping. But in this time that we're going to read here, this reaping is clearly a kind of a judgment reaping. It is definitely not a beneficial thing to those who are being reaped, whereas the other one was uh, spoken of in terms of it's almost like a a, a harvest being re- reaped. Uh, the, the language of the of the product being reaped by the sickle is uh, uses language that's similar to a wheat or a barley harvest, some type of grain. But here, as we're going to see, the product being harvested or reaped are grapes, which is important for us in the. Um, imagery that is reserved for wrath of God, um, treading the wine press of the wrath of God, things like that. So let's read Revelation 14, 70 through 20 reads this way, quote, another angel came out of the temple of he- in heaven. Notice in verse 17, John says, another angel came out of the temple and he too had a sharp sickle. This is this language here leads some to believe that the first person, the first figure that was doing the reaping earlier was not Jesus, but was an angel because it says another angel. But this doesn't have to be an an indicator that the first um, figure was an angel because between the person doing the reaping earlier and this angel here in verse 17, there was already an angel mentioned in the narrative. So this another angel could simply be referring back to the previous angel who was telling the one who had the ship sickle to swing it and reap the earth. So we're talking about at least three figures, one of them possibly being Jesus, and then two angels. And so when John says in verse 17, another angel, and he too had a sickle, It doesn't have to mean that the first figure was an angel with a sickle. It just means that he's just talking about another angel. But notice it says, uh, still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar. So there's more angels here, more than, than the other figure. Could all be angels, could be Jesus and a bunch of angels, but either way. Verse 18, still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. Take your sharp sickle and gather the cluster of grapes from the earth's vine because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. So, This is obviously a picture of the Battle of Armageddon because of the language in verse 20, talking about the the blood flowing, the the, the horse bridles, the length. This is consistent with what we're going to read about later on in the Battle of Armageddon uh, in chapter 19 of Revelation. Also notice that the angel that takes these souls and throws them into the wine press is not necessarily... It doesn't have to be Jesus doing these actions. Angels are performing the actions of gathering those who are ripe for destruction and gathering them and throwing them into a bundle to be burned in Matthew chapter 13. So the angels are the ones doing uh, many of these actions, even though Jesus is the one who's in, in command. He's the captain of heaven's armies, right? He he is Adonai Tzvaot of the Old Testament, the captain of the Lord's Lord of hosts, the Lord of hosts, um, uh, if I translate Adonai Tzvaot literally there. Yet the angels are doing his bidding. So there's nothing wrong with seeing the angels performing the actions. Let's keep reading. We've got about, I think we've got about 15 or 20 minutes left. <clears throat> 